Okay, yeah, let's start the webinar. Um, hello again, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. I'm Manu Parimi. I'm an applications engineer at Plexin. I'd like to welcome our participants today from all over the world, and we hope you're safe and healthy during these difficult times. During today's webinar, I'll be going to discuss multitasking code for the TIC2000 microcontrollers, also referred to as NCUs. Multitasking code unlocks processing power for controls regulating multiple system outputs with dynamics on a range of timescales. I encourage you to ask any questions along the way in the GoToWebinar application window, and we'll try to answer them when appropriate or at the end. Or you can always contact us offline by using our general email address, info at plexin.com. I'll try and keep the webinar to approximately 40 minutes today. First, I will provide an agenda for what I'll cover. Here's the agenda. We will start with a brief background on Plexin and our simulation software Plex. Then I'll introduce the embedded code generation tool for TIC2000 microcontrollers. We then can proceed to explore multitasking code generation for the TIC2000 family of MCUs. We will finish by running an application example of a single phase PV inverter with a cascaded control scheme which will allow me to demonstrate the multitasking code feature. For those of you unfamiliar with Plexin, Plexin has been around since 2002, started by two of my colleagues during their PhD studies at the Technical University of Switzerland, or ETH. The company is still privately owned and based in Zurich. We do also have offices in the Boston area in Massachusetts, where I sit, and also Seattle, Washington. Plex is our flagship product, a simulation software in two versions, Plex Blockset and Plex Standalone. Blockset being integrated into the MATLAB Simulink ecosystem and Standalone is an independent tool. Plex was developed from the very beginning to solve the typical difficulties encountered when modeling and simulating power electronic and motor drive systems. Plex is not only an electrical circuit simulator, but as we can see here, it can simulate multiple physical domains, such as mechanical, magnetic, and thermal systems, as well as supports modeling and design of continuous and discrete control systems. Plex supports model-based development of digital control systems with automatic code generation via the Plex Coder, which is the focus of this webinar. Our product portfolio also includes a real-time simulator platform, the RTBox, which is relevant for designing and testing power electronic systems and will be used in today's session to test the generated code. Before we begin, I should mention that two previously held webinars covered the basics of embedded code generation in Plex. The links to these recorded webinars are listed on the screen here. They go through the motivation behind using the automated code generation and code generation workflow in detail. Both webinars show using the TIC2000 code generation to control power hardware. There will be some overlap with this webinar, but we'll mainly focus on multitasking code generation today. Although the main focus of today's webinar is multitasking code generation, it is important to first understand embedded code generation in Plex. Therefore, we will start with the introduction of embedded code generation and then proceed with multitask code generation. Let's begin with the motivation behind using the coder. Digital control is widespread in the industry due to low cost NCUs and the need to execute advanced flexible control strategies. However, utilizing embedded process is not straightforward and it requires expertise in embedded systems and also time for engineers to prototype and test this embedded code. Also, these processors have several low level registers that the programmer must understand and configure, which can require reading thousands of pages of documentation to implement the desired peripheral configurations. Furthermore, there is not necessarily a one-to-one -one relation between the model and the MCU code, so there is a potential for translation errors between the simulation model and the handwritten code. Also, testing and finding bugs on real hard hardware with handwritten code can be challenging. These challenges can be addressed by using embedded code generation for microprocessors. The code generation essentially translates a control model 
implemented in Plex into C code that runs on a microprocessor. By generating the code automatically from the model, there is a significant reduction in time spent coding and debugging, allowing engineers to spend time on early stage prototyping, iterating on their actual control design and testing with hardware. Overall, the coder lowers the barrier to entry in working with embedded processors and moves efforts from software engineering to control engineering. And the generated code adheres to this model definition. So basically, one model drives simulation, embedded controls, and testing. To enable the code generation for TIC2000 MCUs, the TIC2000 target support package, or TSP, is required. This package provides the TIC2000 target library blocks and the application framework for the supported TI MCUs. The package also comes with demo models and extensive documentation. One key strength of the Plex embedded workflow is that the peripherals, such as the PWM, ADC, and also communication capabilities like CAN and SPI and so on, are configured in the Plex schematic using components from the Plex library. We call these target IO, blo IO blocks, and these components configure the peripheral using intuitive parameters, much like regular Plex components. Additionally, external TI tools are used behind the scenes to compile the code and deploy the application to the MCU directly from Plex. Okay, let's open Plex standalone. Here on the left, we have the Plex library browser. The TIC2000 target support package comes with the TIC2000 target support library. These are the essential components used to configure the microprocessor peripherals. We have the ADC, digital IOs, PWM generation, CAN, um, and SPI support, and other additional components. I should mention that all of these components I'm going to show here are in Plex block set as well. As I stated previously, these components are the key strength of the Plex embedded workflow. For example, the MCU's PWM component has fields such as carrier type, carrier frequency, blanking time, as opposed to handwritten code where the peripherals are configured at a register level. While we are here, let's create a simple model. Let's provide a duty cycle input to the PWM block using a constant block. Oh, by the way, with Plex 4.4, to access the library browser, you can simply start typing in the component uh, that you need directly from the schematic by simply typing in like I just did. So for constant block, you can just start typing anywhere and you have the block here. Obviously, you can also access this from the library browser. All right, so this is my duty cycle input. Let's leave this PWM uh, at default settings and a complementary PWM pair will be generated on PWM channel one. Let's also blink an LED on the launchpad board that we are using for this demo. Let me grab a digital out block and create a circuit to blink an LED. For that, I need a delay and a logical operator. So this is my circuit to blink an LED. Let's blink the LED every half a second. Okay, the launch pad that I'm using here is a 28069 launch pad. Let me turn on my camera to show you my hardware setup. Um, you should now see my webcam video. You can adjust the size of the webcam video relative to the screen by adjusting the horizontal or vertical slider on your screen. So here's my hardware setup I'll use for this webinar. I have a Plex RT Box 1, which is the real-time simulator. 
And the front of this box contains interface connections for analog and digital signals. And this red board is a Texas Instruments 2806 NIR launchpad. And then we have the green board that has been developed by Plexim. And it is an interface or a breakout board used to route signals from the RT box to the MCU. At this point, since all we are doing are generating PWM signals and blinking an LED on the launch pad, I don't yet need the RT box. So my RT box is actually powered off and we are only communicating with the 28069 launch pad. There is a USB cable, the black USB cable that you're seeing that connects the launch pad to my computer and we'll use this USB cable to program the microcontroller directly from Plex and we'll also use the same USB cable to connect the microprocessor by a serial connection to receive real-time waveforms. We call that an external mode connection and I'll, I'll talk about that later in the webinar. For now, let's complete this model. So since I'm using the 28069 launchpad, I'll set the digital out GPIO to 34. So this should blink the red LED on my launchpad. Now let's save the model. Okay, now let's configure the code generation settings. This all happens in this Plex Coder tab, which you'll need a Plex Coder license to see. So here are the basic settings. First, we define a discretization, discretization step size. This specifies not only how our continuous state space model is discretized, but also how often our control loop interrupt is triggered. Let's have our controller run at a switching frequency of 10 kilohertz. Next, we have the parameter inlining tab. When we are generating code, we generally hard code certain, para, uh, certain parameters for code size and efficiency purposes. We can also specify exceptions to the default behavior and specify which parameters are tunable. This window configures which parameters are constants in the generated code or tunable. Next, we have the target tab. Here, we select the desired target. In our case, it's 28069 launchpad, so I'm choosing 2806X. And we can change these settings if necessary. We can leave these at default now. And there's two build type options. There's build and program, and there's generate code into CCS or Code Composer Studio project. CCS is the IDE for TI embedded processor development. We supply a pre-configured template CCS project as part of the target support package. The advantage of using CCS is you have access to their debugging environment and tools. For more details, uh, consult the tutorials page on Plexim website. For this webinar, I'm going to directly build and program from Plex, so I'm going to choose build and program. And there's two types of build configuration. You can run from Flash or run from RAM. I'm going to choose run from RAM. And my board type is Launchpad, so I'm choosing Launchpad. And then you can build. So now Plex is compiling the model. Um, and then now it's, it flashed onto the Launchpad. If you're looking at the webcam video, the LED is blinking, indicating that we deployed our model on the launch pad. We can also inspect the generated code. So let me open. Um, so this is the file, the, the Plex model that we saved. And there's this code gen directory where we can actually inspect the generated code. And everything we do, including how the code is generated for the peripheral blocks, and the generated code is open and it, it is conceivably modified by the user. Okay. So now let's switch to slides and discuss multitasking code. With Plex 4.4, the Plex coder has been enhanced with the capability to generate code for multitasking systems. Multitasking code, as I mentioned previously, unlocks processing power for controls regulating multiple system outputs with dynamics on a range of timescales. The TIC2000 application framework includes a rate monotonic scheduler 
to allow precise and efficient execution of the digital control routes. So the shorter the period, the higher the priority. Therefore, the base task here with the shortest period has the highest priority. Additionally, up to 15 slower and lower priority tasks executed at different rates can be specified. A lowest priority background task also exists to handle non-time critical tasks. Multitasking is especially useful to prioritize critical tasks. So without multitasking, the MCU would have to run the base task and the additional task time between interrupts. But with multitasking, with every control task trigger interrupt issued, any lower priority tasks, like we're seeing here, are interrupted and the base task is executed. This ensures that the control task has the highest priority. In addition, the lower priority tasks are periodically triggered and executed when no higher priority tasks are active or pending. Once the base and additional tasks have completed, the system continues with the background task, which has the lowest priority operations. Note that the background task um, cannot be accessed by the user. This is an internal task, whereas uh, the user has access to the base task and 15 additional tasks, so 16 tasks overall. Let's go back to our example here. Here we can create a separate task for blinking the LED since it's slower and lower priority than generating PWM signals. Multitasking code generation is configured in the scheduling tab here of the coder options window. So right now we have the tasking mode set to single tasking. We can switch this to multitasking. And there's two types of task configuration. With automatic task configuration, Flex create a task for each unique fixed step discrete sample time in the model. All blocks that have the same sample time are assigned to the same task. Blocks with multiple sample times are assigned to the base task associated with the base sample time. If we choose to specify the task configuration, we can define a set of tasks here. A task has a task name, sample time, and this sample time must be an integer multiple of the base sample time. And the value zero here is replaced with the base sample time itself. And there's a default column that specifies the default task. In case of an RT box two or RT box three, there's also a core. So a task is associated with the core, but multitasking for the RT box will be covered in a separate webinar. So for now, Let's switch to the TI-28069 target and let's create a new task for our LED called LED with a sample time of 0 0.5. Okay, accept. Also, the base task or the base sample time is always equal to the discretization step size that we mentioned here. Now, to assign this LED task to our model, we need to copy a task component or a task frame component into our schematic and drag this task frame around the blocks of interest. So in our case, it's, it's the circuit for blinking an LED and then double click on the task to choose the desired task configuration. So in our case, it's the LED task. Blocks that are not enclosed by this task frame, they are scheduled in the default task. In our case, the default task is the base task. So the PWM signals are automatically assigned to the base task. And note that blocks in this task frame do not need to have the same sample time as the tasks that are assigned to. The block sample time can be continuous or an integer multiple of the task sample time. So now we have assigned um, an LED task to this LED circuit. So when we rebuild the model, the PWM task, in this case, which is the base task, has a higher priority and can interrupt 
So the base task, which is the PWM task, has a higher priority, and then it can actually interrupt our LED task. Note that this figure is simplified for visual clarity, and it, it does not represent the real circuit. Okay, now let's explore an actual application example. Um, let's go back to Plex standalone and from window, demo models. Here we have the demo models included with Plex and the RTBox support package. Apart from the demo models uh, included with Plex and RTBox, we also have a separate set of demo models included with the TIC2000 target support package as well. Let's open the single phase PV inverter circuit with a cascaded controller. We can see that the brief descriptions of the power circuit and the control system model and brief descriptions on how to configure the TSE 2000 target library components, as well as real-time simulation instructions are provided here. And this demo model uh, uses the Plex RT box to perform hardware in the loop testing of the generated embedded code. So here's the hardware setup, which is same as the one you're, you're seeing on the webcam video. So let me power on my RT box at this point. The plant model here, in this case, it's a single phase PV inverter, which I'll describe in a minute, is emulated on the Plex RT box, which is connected to my host computer via an ethernet cable. As I stated previously, the front of the box contains the interface connections for analog and digital signals. And this red board is the Texas Instruments 28069 launchpad that we've been using. And this green board, as I stated previously, has been developed by Texan. And it, and it is an interface board or a breakout board used to route the signals from the controller to the box. So basically now we'll have a hardware in the loop um, simulation where the plant model is being run on the RT box and then the controller subsystem, which I'll show in a minute, will run that on the MCU. So the MCU will be sending PWM signals to the box and the RT box will send the analog um, measurements of voltage and current back to the MCU. So we have a closed loop real-time simulation um, going on over here. So let's open the model. Uh, the model includes a plant subsystem and a controller subsystem. And we'll run the plant subsystem on the RT box, as I, as I mentioned before, and then the controller subsystem on this TI C2000 MCU. Notice that both these subsystems have been enabled for code generation as indicated by this thick outer border of the subsystem blocks. And this has been done from the execution settings dialog. So here we've enabled code generation for both these subsystems. Okay, let's now look at the plant model. The plant subsystem has been configured to run on the RT box. Therefore, it uses the RT box target uh, library components. The PV string model here, let me open and look under the mask. The PV string model here is based on this nonlinear current source that accurately models the IV characteristic characteristics with variable inputs of sun intensity, output voltage here, and temperature using this 3D lookup table. And the data, the current surface data, uh, is being received from an external .mat file. And the array, the PV string array, is a lumped model, and it is made up of 22 PV modules connected in each string with two strings connected in parallel. Also, the sun insulation value that we're providing the PV array is toggled in between one kilowatt hour per meter square and a reduced insulation level of 0.7 kilowatt, kilowatt hour per meter square every two seconds. This is to model a plant disturbance and test our control algorithm. 
the output, the steady state output of this solar array here is approximately 380 volts DC. And this is connected to a 230 volt, 50 hertz single phase grid via full bridge inverter implemented using um, the full bridge power module component and an LCL output filter. The PWM capture block here captures the PWM signals from the controller and the DC input and AC output measurements, voltage and current measurements are connected to these analog out blocks, which are then fed to the MCU. Since the ADCs on the MCU can only accept values up to 3.3 volts, the analog outputs are scaled and offset to be within that range. Okay, now let's look at the controller subsystem. The controller subsystem is configured to be executed on a C2000 MCU, in our case, a 28069 launchpad. Therefore, it uses the ADC and PWM targets of the TIC2000 uh, target library. This controller subsystem has three control loops. The outer NPP controller ensures that maximum power is extracted from the PV string for a given insulation level. To do this, it calculates the optimal PV terminal voltage using an MPP algorithm known as DP by DV or incremental conductance control. And as we're seeing, this is implemented using um, a C script block. Next, we have the voltage controller. And the voltage controller is based on a type 2 controller. And this regulates the PV voltage to its optimal level by controlling the amount of current that is in injected into the grid. And finally, we have the innermost current controller. And the controller sets the modulation index of the inverter such that the desired current is injected into the grid. And the current controller is based on a proportional resonant controller with a resonant frequency of 50 hertz to ensure no tracking error is present. The control scheme here, <clears throat> excuse me, the control scheme here is cascaded with a fast inner current control loop followed by a slower DC voltage control loop and an even slower outer MPP loop. Therefore, multitasking code is well suited for this type of control. Therefore, in this model, we have created three lower priority tasks. So if then we go back to the scheduling tab, we'll see that in addition to the base task, there are three uh, slower and lower priority tasks here. Um, we have the MPP control task, we have the voltage control task, and we are also blinking an LED. So we have an LED task. And the task frame boundary that we've defined here combined with this task configuration defines the priority of execution of these components within. All the components outside of these task frames, such as the ADC or the PWM or our current controller, they are executed at the base sample time because these are the default tasks. And the scope component is always executed at the base sample time, irrespective of the task frame boundary. So let's look at the slides again. As I stated previously, uh, the base task is always executed at the highest priority. And with every control task trigger interrupt issued in our case by the ADC, the lower priority tasks are interrupted and the base task is executed. This ensures that the control task has the highest priority. And the additional tasks that we have here are actually prioritized based on the sample time. Once the base task is executed, the voltage control task with the second shortest time period is executed, followed by the MPP control task and then the LED task. I should mention that this figure is also simplified because in reality, the voltage control task is 10 times slower uh, but not so in the figure. This is just for visual clarity. Note that any higher priority task can interrupt a lower priority task. In this case, the base task 
can interrupt the voltage control task and the voltage control task can interrupt the MPP control task and the MPP control task can interrupt the LED task. Once all these tasks are executed, again, the system continues with the background task, which is uh, where the lowest priority operations are processed. Again, the background task is not cannot be accessed by the user, uh, but the user can access all the other tasks. If the base task is still executing, when a second control task interrupt is received, then the processor will halt and an assertion, assertion will be generated. Similar behavior occurs if a low priority task does not complete by the time it is scheduled to execute again. Assertions can be monitored using CCS debug tools, but you can also detect these as assertions visually by including um, the periodic LED as we are doing in our model. So if the LED is not blinking, uh, even if we built the model on the MCU, this means that the uh, MCU is halting. Okay, now let's look at the real-time simulation. But before that, let's run the simulation on Flex. Note that the target I.O. blocks of both the RT box as well as the C2000 target are functional in the simulation. They include a behavioral model of the component, so we can verify if the model and the peripherals are configured appropriately before testing on the hardware. Okay, so first let's run the simulation on Plex. By the way, um, from the initialization command window here, we can see that this particular model supports four separate launchpad targets. In our case, we are using 28069 launchpad, so I'm choosing this, uh, but we could also select any of the other targets that, th that this model supports. Okay, uh, and this is for the real-time simulation. Uh, right now, we are running a simulation in Plex, so these are our results. Let's save these results as offline. By offline, I mean the simulation was completely um, in Plex. The simulation was running in Plex. Uh, basically, we are not yet using the RT box or the MCU, which I'll then perform a real-time simulation on. Right now, it's an offline simulation because we were just running the model on Plex. Now, let's continue with the real-time simulation. To do that, the first step is to open the coder tab. The first step is to build the plant subsystem on the RT box. So I have the Plex RT box one as a target, and I'll choose my RT box and then build. So right now, the plant subsystem. Um, the subsystem is being uploaded onto my RT box target. Also note that in order to enable or disable the PWM signals during runtime, I need to um, enable a dip switch on, on the launchpad interface board, which is the green board. This is because in the controller subsystem, we have this power stage protection block. Basically, power stage protection block implements an interlock, which is a safety mechanism to enable or disable PWM outputs. So PWM outputs are disabled unless there is a logical low to high transition um, on, on the GPIO that, that we define here, which is then connected to the dip switch on the launchpad interface board. Okay, now the plant model is running on the RT box. We can we can see that the blue LED on the RT box, which is the running LED, um, is now on. Next, let's deploy the controller subsystem onto the 28069 launchpad. So I'll click build.
Okay, now the controller subsystem is running on the MCU. So what we did just now was we deployed the plant subsystem onto the RT box and the controller subsystem onto the MCU. So we have a real-time simulation going on between the RT box and the MCU. And as I mentioned, we need to flip the dip switch to enable the MCU. Um, so that's what I'll do. I'll flip the switch. And now um, the MCU should be enabled and it should exchange the PWM signals. It should send the PWM signals to the RT box and then the RT box will be sending the analog outputs to the MCU. So we can actually see the waveforms in real time by enabling the external mode. So let's enable the external mode. External mode again means the Plex schematic is synchronized with an external source. In our case, it's the launchpad device as well as the RT box. And we can see the waveforms extracted from a signal buffer um, on these devices on the Plex scope. So I'll connect to my I'll connect to my controller as well as to my plant. Um, we can also define a trigger channel if needed. Okay, now we should be able to see the real time signals. So here we have the real time signals from the MCU. If you see in the video, there are this blue and red LED blinking, visually showing that we're communicating with the MCU. Um, so these are the signals that are obtained from the MCU. And we can also see the real-time signals from the RT box. So we have saved the offline traces. So let me uncheck that. So these are the real-time traces that we are seeing from the RT box. These two are the real-time traces from the RT box. And we can see that when we are doing this step change in the insulation level, um, at two seconds, we are going from one kilowatt hour per meter square to 0.7 kilowatt hour per meter square. So this we can also see in real time. Now let me check the offline traces. And when I zoom in, you can see that the Offline and real time results are in close agreement. So, if you see that there are two traces, so even here, you can see that the offline um, and real time traces are in close agreement. Again, by offline, I mean the simulation results in Plex, and by real time, I mean the, the results from the real time communication between the MCU and the RT box. Okay. Let me close this. And since we are running the multitasking code on the controller, we can actually test the CPU load by using the CPU load block. So let me disconnect from my plant and the controller. And let's get the CPU load component and connect that to a scope. So let me go ahead and rebuild my controller on the MCU. Okay, so let me now connect to the external mode. I have to enable the MCU again by flipping the dip switch. We can see that uh, the processor load is about 58.5%. Let me save this trace and call it multitask. And I'll go back to the coder options window to disconnect from the coder and switch the tasking mode from multitasking to single tasking. 
and rebuild the model. So let's compare the CPU load between multitasking and single tasking. So now the model is running on my controller. Again, I have to re-enable the MCU by flipping the tip switch and connect to my controller's external mode. So we can see, so this, the, uh, the waveform, the dotted waveform is from multitasking. And then here we have the CPU load from single tasking. And we can see uh, that with multitasking, the CPU load is lower. All right then, uh, that concludes my planned talking points for introducing the multitasking code for the TSC 2000 MCUs and the embedded code generation workflow. Today, we talked about embedded code generation in Flex and its advantages. Then we showed a simple model of how to configure multitasking code for the TIC2000 processor and highlighted this application example of this power electronic circuit with a cascaded control loop. Feel free to explore the other demo models uh, and you can modify them to include the multitasking code wherever applicable. We appreciate you all tuning in today, and I hope you found this helpful. A recording of this session will be made available on our website and YouTube pages within a day or so. If you have any specific questions, please send them to support uh, at plexim.com. And thank you. Thanks a lot for your time, um, and thank you for attending the webinar. I'm going to end the webinar now. Thanks again.